Hi, everyone. My name is Trudy McKenna, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's Talks at Google event featuring best-selling author, educator, and consultant Rachel Simmons. Um, as the mother of an 11-year-old girl, I've been a big fan of Rachel's for a few years now, and I found her work invaluable as I've worked to understand and help my daughter navigate the challenges of growing up today. And let me tell you, there are more than a few. <laughs> Um, I've also been a little bit surprised to find that Rachel's lessons and teachings have been so relevant to my own life because, shocker, it turns out the challenges that girls face don't just stop at the end of adolescence. Um, so I'm really happy Rachel's here to join us today. A bit more about Rachel. She is the New York Times bestselling author of the books Odd Girl Out and The Curse of the Good Girl. Her most recent book, which she'll be talking about with us today, is Enough As She Is, How to Help Girls Move Beyond Impossible Standards of Success to Live Healthy, Happy, and Fulfilling Lives. Pretty cool. Rachel is also an educator. She consults nationally on women's professional development and is a national spokesperson for the Always Like a Girl and KEDS Brave Life Project campaigns. She was the host of the PBS television special A Girl's Life, and her writing has appeared in the Washington Post, Atlantic, Slate, and the New York Times. Rachel is a, a regular contributor to Good Morning America and appears often in the national media. Odd Girl Out was adapted into a highly acclaimed Lifetime television movie. Rachel co-founded the national nonprofit Girls Leadership, and that's actually very important and important as an organization because what it does is it takes the research and work that she's done and puts it into actual practical application. We're lucky that Simone, who co-founded Girls Leadership and is the executive director, is here with us today, and we'll have the opportunity to learn more about that amazing organization as well at the end of Rachel's talk. We will have some time for Q&A. For those of you on live stream, there is a Dory available. It is go slash Rachel Simmons dash Dory. And for those of you who have books in hand, Rachel has kindly offered to stick around after the talk at the back of the room to sign them. With that, please join me in welcoming Rachel Simmons. Thanks, Trudy. Thank you. Um, hello. It is a pleasure to be with you today. I want to thank Google um, and Google Talks and Trudy McKenna for putting this together. Um, so I want to talk with you both as potential parents in the audience, but also as individuals, because as Trudy said, there's no question that a lot of what I write about not only applies to girls, but applies to grown-ups, applies to boys and men. And um, I have had that pointed out to me many, many times over the last four weeks. I've been touring this book all over the country. Um, today's actually the last day of my tour, so woohoo. And, um, and so, yeah, so I really, um, and if I'm honest, so much of what I write about Come from comes from personal challenges that I myself have been navigating and trying to make peace with. And so with that, I encourage you to listen with lots of different hats. Um, today, what I'd like to explore with you in the 30 minutes or so that I have to talk with you are three things. One is uh, to talk about ways that the culture has changed for girls since uh, we were teens. Two is I want to be a translator for you of some of what I would say are the more toxic messages about success that girls are getting. Um, because I think it's very important that we as advocates for girls, as educators, as teachers, as parents, that we learn how to talk back to some of those messages um, so that we can shield them from those messages. And finally, um, what are the skills that you both need, meaning you both parent and girl need, um, to help her redefine success in some healthy ways? So let's start off with a couple of changes that have occurred um, since I was younger. Although I kind of want to start with even an earlier change um, and meaning something that's been around for a long time. And I'm going to ask the members of the audience to do a brief exercise. I promise there won't be um, anything else after this. You can be totally just hanging out. But if you could sit as you would imagine a typical guy sits in his chair. Like how do you... Okay, so everybody, for those of you live streaming, everybody's like man spreading right now. Okay, Everyone's like spread now. And then how do you think a typical girl sits in her chair? There's no more laughing, just if you can't hear. Um, the typical girl posture, everyone is starting to contract. Everyone's sitting up straight, crossing their legs, looking like they're being watched. And yeah, you guys were totally manspreading during the, during the man thing. And 
I love that activity because I think it illustrates what people would call gender norms. Some of the unwritten rules that girls and guys grow up with about how you're supposed to act. And what I also like about that activity, and it's a great one to do with your own family, is it allows us to think not just about the space that guys might be given to take up with their bodies, but also with their voices and their opinions and their appetites. Because when I ask you to sit like a girl, everyone suddenly gets smaller. And so there are also messages that girls get about the permission they should be taking up or not taking up, um, the space that they should be taking up or not taking up with their voices and their opinions. Um, and why does this matter? Well, it matters because in addition to this pressure that girls get not to take up too much space, we have also said to girls, hey, guess what? You can go do and be anything. So we've said to girls, like, would you like to go now be an engineer? Fantastic. Would you like to go work at Google and study cognitive science and, you know, do robotics? Absolutely awesome. What we haven't done is we haven't said to them, but you don't have to worry about being liked anymore. You don't have to worry about pleasing others anymore. You don't have to worry about having that perfect bikini body anymore. What psychologists call what girls are facing right now is role overload which basically means too many roles for one person to play. Role overload is linked to a lot of stress, as you can imagine. Um, you may be surprised or not to learn that adolescent girls get the least sleep of any group of youth. And I honestly think that this is in part due to the expectation that you not just be smart, but you also better get one like per minute on Instagram. Um, God help you if you don't. You also need to be involved in activities. You need to be in charge of captain of a team. Um, and that is fatiguing. It leads to early burnout. And it also creates what researchers call role conflict. So in other words, in a 24-hour day, like what it takes to have the bikini body that you want. I keep saying bikini body because... If you open up Instagram um, and you, at, even this week, there's a lot of young people on spring break. And I actually follow a lot of them. And luckily, they usually forget that I'm following them so I can learn. <laughs> um, but there's a ton of bikini pictures coming out, right? And it's all about look at me and look at my body. And it's a very specific kind of body that's being shown off. And what we're finding actually in the research is that Whereas it used to be that like when I was, you know, a hundred years ago, a teenager, um, and I wanted to look at somebody's cute little body, I would have to go to the grocery store. I'd have to buy a magazine. I'd have to look at a celebrity. What's different for girls is that all you have to do is open your phone. And not only are you going to see the bodies of celebrities, but you're also going to see um, the bodies of your friends. And that can create, and that is creating body shame. That is creating um, concern and a loss of confidence in their own bodies. So these are some of the things that are really different. Um, another thing that I would call as different is what I uh, like to affectionately call the college application industrial complex. Um, and by that, I mean the very intense pressure that girls face almost from middle school at this point. That the, the sort of message they get that if they don't craft themselves into the most perfect specimen worthy of college admission, they are going to lead mediocre lives. They really get this pressure that um, they have to be absolutely amazing at everything they do. And if they don't, um, I don't know, like cure a major disease in their science project in middle school, like they're going to lead very unhappy lives. And what they feel is that their whole worthiness is kind of riding on that day, whether or not they get accepted into the college of their choice. And I think what it's doing is it's sending them some very toxic messages about success. Um, one of them is the expectation that they be amazing at everything that they do. What can you say to girls and frankly to ourselves about this, this expectation? I mean, first of all, there's absolutely no way that we can be amazing at everything we do. No way. And in fact, if you expect yourself always, I mean, what I do with girls, I sort of say, if you always expect yourself to be up here, you are invariably going to feel that you are not enough. You will feel that you are less than. You will feel that you, um, in the moment as you are, are not worthy. And it is impossible to try to be amazing at everything you do. And when you try, in addition to feeling that self-criticism, the other thing that happens is that you feel like you can't take any risks. And, um, you know, as I speak at a place like Google, I feel like Google is all about, you know, taking risks, asking questions, being curious. And if you feel that you have to play it safe because you can't mess up because you've got to get that perfect resume, you've got to have that perfect GPA, your muscle for risk taking, 
your ability to comfortably face uncertainty, that will atrophy. And I think what we want for our girls, if you really want to be brave, you have to regularly put yourself out there in small ways. I never say, I, I'm not a big believer in the um, Eleanor Roosevelt saying, uh, do something every day that scares you. Because I'm kind of like, who wants to be scared every day? Do you guys want to be scared every day? I'm not down with that personally. No, I would like to be like a little nervous every day. I could do that. I could get with that. Um, that was my long-winded way of saying that comfort with risk-taking happens through small things that we do all the time to challenge ourselves. When girls are trying to be perfect, they lose comfort with risk-taking and it diminishes their courage. The other thing that happens is what I... Um, affectionately call a mass mass nationwide adolescent hallucination that all my friends are doing and being more than I am. Um, in other words, girls are often taken with the sense that like, obviously all my friends are smarter than me. All my friends are doing more than me. Um, they're cooler than I am. And I think it's super important to talk to girls about the kind of futility of that attitude. Because the reason why you think everyone's doing more than you is because you don't feel enough. If you're trying to get up here all the time, of course you're looking over your shoulder being like, who's coming up behind me? One of the most common questions I've been asked on the road for this tour has come from girls who come to my talk and they say, what am I supposed to do about the fact that I don't feel happy for my friends when they succeed? What do I do about the fact that like, there's something, there's a competition between me and my friends where I don't feel like, I don't feel good about it. And we're not talking about it. And it's eating away at our relationship. Now, I think this is a warning sign in terms of when we think about women supporting other women. If girls are operating from a belief that even their friends are potentially threats to their own success, again, stemming from that sense that they are not enough, what does that mean for how women support each other later on? So um, there are quite a few... Um, I wouldn't call them side effects, but there are real consequences to what's happening around the culture in terms of that pressure to be admitted to a four-year college or university. Um, so what are some things you can say to the girl in your life who might be struggling? I have been totally blown away by how much the following makes a difference to a teenager's well-being. Saying to them, I don't think this is your fault, what you're going through. In other words, a lot of teenagers, girls and guys, who are overwhelmed by anxiety and stress, they very, um, they're very convinced that like, what's wrong with me that I can't overcome this? What's wrong with me that I can't keep up? And to say to a teenager, you know what? What's wrong has very little to do with you and much more to do with how broken this culture is around achievement and success and the pressures that it's putting on you. It's very, it's transformative for a teenager because, and I don't want to oversimplify my work, but I do believe that when you can make a teenager feel like they're not the only one suffering from something, and I mean, I think we all can feel the benefits of that awareness, but when you can tell her, this isn't just you, it makes a huge difference. The other thing I think we need to say is we don't want to tell them, um, why are you guys putting so much pressure on yourselves? I know I was told that many years ago by my parents. And I actually wrote an article in the Washington Post about a month ago about this very thing. And in it, I really call on parents to stop telling their kids that they put too much pressure on themselves. And here's why. When you say that to a kid, the implication is, if you could just chill, everything would be fine. Because it's just like all you, that you're just doing this to yourself. When in fact we know, and hopefully I've convinced you somewhat, that this is a cultural issue. This is something much bigger than what, what one kid is doing to herself. And it's actually much more helpful to your kid to hear that everybody's struggling right now. And you could have a really peaceful home. Like, let me be clear. You could have an amazing house that is like super zen and like very spa-like and you really aren't putting pressure on your kid. And I totally believe you that you're not. However, the second your kid walks out of your house, she is flooded with that stress. So it's not about what she's doing to herself. I want to talk about imposter syndrome right now. Um, this is a picture of Maya Angelou, and, who is obviously a giant of a, a human being um, and, and a writer and a poet and so many things. She has been very public about her struggle with imposter syndrome. And she believes uh, and has said that you know, she has this abiding fear that at some point she's going to be found out. 
And when she's found out, you know, she's everyone's going to see that she's not nearly as smart or as talented as everyone thinks. Well, one of the great surprises of my research with girls has been the extent to which imposter syndrome is with them from a very early age. In fact, I discovered research that said that it's firmly in place by adolescence. And I ask my students, I work on a college campus, and I ask my students all the time to finish this sentence. I, I say, sometimes I worry that I'm not as blank as other people think I am. Um, and I've also started doing the same with adults. The most common response, the most common fill in the blank is, I worry that I'm not as smart as other people think I am. So what do we say to our kids and to ourselves? Because my goodness, I also struggle with imposter syndrome for sure. Um, and, um, and relatively frequently, I was gonna joke between meals, but not that frequently, but a lot. Um, you know, when that voice comes up inside of us, when we hear that voice that says, you don't deserve to be here, you don't belong here, you don't have what it takes, we have to talk back to it. And we do this in two ways. One is, we realize that this voice is a voice inside of us, but it's not the voice that is us, right? It, it's not you. It's the small, scared part of you that kind of rears its head, but it does not mean that it is you. So we really need to teach not only our kids, but ourselves that that's a recurring part of us, but we don't over-identify with it. And the second thing you do is you name it. And I've actually had, I have one student who named her imposter voice Lester, which I thought was hilarious. <laughs> And so she'd be like, yo, Lester, I got this. You step off, okay? Like, Lester, I hear you. I hear you telling me that I'm not like smart enough to be in this AP class or I'm not whatever it is enough. Chill, dude, just have a seat. And so when you talk back to and you name that voice, it actually gives you an ability to separate yourself from it. Um, gratitude is a very powerful practice that research tells us does everything from help us sleep better at night um, boost our immune systems, and elevate our wellness. And basically what this sounds like is a kind of simple acknowledgement, which you can do anytime, of what it is you are grateful for right now. It does not have to be epic or polished or important beyond, I'm happy the sun came out. Like I, You know what I'm grateful for today? Honestly, I was staying in Mill Valley last night because I spoke uh, there for my book. I woke up. I didn't have time to go to the gym, which was five minutes away. And there was a terrible storm here last night and um, and somehow it stopped raining and I got to go run outside. And a few minutes after I came back in, it started pouring. And I just took a moment and said, I'm so grateful that I got to get my heart rate up today. That's enough, that's enough. When we can in small moments say, this thing that happened, that's enough for me, it allows us to be on the ground instead of going up here. It allows us to affirm what matters right now. But we also have to be willing to buy into the fact that the small things count. And I think a gradual practice, and I, I want to say practice because it's just like that muscle that we have to flex for risk taking. It's just like to do something that makes you nervous every day. We're not talking about becoming like a Zen monk. We're talking about you're driving to work. Uh, what are you grateful for? Just stop and think about it. And this can open up something inside of you, a place of appreciation that can make you feel enough in this very moment right now. And I, it's been very powerful for me um, and my young daughter as well. Well, I hope it's you know, powerful for her. I might just be hallucinating, but I think it's, I'm hoping that it is. Um, there are a couple things that, that I want to cover in this talk beyond some of the smaller pieces of advice that I've given you that are in the research um, considered very palliative uh, factors in adolescent wellness. One of them is purpose. So what's purpose? Purpose, having a sense of purpose in your life means that you do something that you're into. You really like doing this, pursuing this goal. But this particular goal or this thing that you're involved in connects you to something bigger than you. All right. It's not like a self-oriented goal. So let's just think of something purposeful, um, something that makes an impact on the world in some way. I mean, it could be volunteering. It could also be creating an app. It doesn't mean that it has to be public service oriented. I was on a public radio show in the Bay Area yesterday. A caller phoned in and talked about how his daughter, who had been riven with anxiety, discovered juggling. And once she discovered juggling, she began traveling and juggling for underserved children. And that this healed her. And that's a sense of purpose. She was part of something bigger than herself. Contrast that 
with the kid who says, my goal is to get good grades. My goal is to be accepted into a brand name college. My goal is to score perfect score on the SAT. People who are driven by self-oriented goals tend to be less happy. They also tend to be less resilient. Um, I'll tell you who else actually, just to, I want to deviate from this purpose or, or digress from this purpose conversation for just a moment to say that there's another, there are two other differences that I want to talk with you about in terms of types of goals you pursue. So Carol Dweck, who is a psychologist based at Stanford University who studies motivation, talks about the difference between pursuing a performance goal and a learning goal. Now, a performance goal is when you undertake something because of the approval that you might get from others or because you wish to avoid failure. A learning goal, which, spoiler alert, is what we want girls to have and what we should all be trying to pursue um, more than anything, is when you undertake a goal because you're trying to master something. You want to you undertake this thing because you really want to learn about it. So for example, I want to master the French, uh, the past tense in French. That's a learning goal. I want to get an A in French is a performance goal. Now, there's nothing wrong with performance goals on their face. Like it's totally fine to want to be to strive for attention and reward, but that can't be the primary thing that drives you. Definitely not, because for those people who are driven per primarily by performance goals, they are also less resilient. They are also more unhappy. Now, why are you why are you less tough if you're driven by a performance goal? Well, think about it. If what is driving you isn't coming from within, isn't inspired by a kind of genuine desire that comes intrinsically from within you, it's so much easier to knock you over. So you have a setback, and because you're more invested in what other people think, it's so much easier to get knocked over because you don't have the grounding in your own desire and in your own motivation. So what that means for you as parents or for yourself as you pursue your own goals is to say, hey, am I doing this because I want to or because I feel like I have to? Are you taking that class, you could say to your kid, because you, you really want to learn this thing or are you doing it because you think it looks good? And again, nothing wrong with wanting to look good, but that can't be the primary reason why. Purposeful, a purposeful life is on the decline in terms of goals of adolescents. Adolescents are increasingly saying, I want to make money. I want to, you know, get a great job. I want to go to a good college. The percentage of students who say, I want to lead a meaningful life has experienced a steep decline. And researchers believe this is absolutely related to the decline in wellness in teenagers. When you are um, with your daughter, and if your daughter or you, um, honestly, because I'm, what I'm about to say absolutely comes to my own mind as I stand in the face of a risk, but if you want to get your kid to do something that's challenging to her, if you yourself want to take a leap, there are three questions that work really well. One is, what do you think the worst that could happen is? And I want to clarify here. Girls are particularly good at telling you the absolute worst thing that could happen on a catastrophic level. And so I want to just sort of amend this by saying like actual worst that could happen, not like catastrophe worst that could happen, um, you know, because girls are such good catastrophizers. And then can you live with it? So for example, um, and I say this too because I know a lot of girls who don't want to take risks. They, they don't want to raise their hands unless they have the right answer. They don't want to try out for the play because they're afraid they won't get a part. They have like application fear. I don't want to apply for that job because I'm afraid I won't get it or that internship or that fellowship. Um, and so we say to them, what is the worst that can happen and can you live with that? It's very rare that I have a student who says, no, I can't live with that. Most people, once they really are willing to look the consequence, not the catastrophe consequence, the legit one in the eye, they're like, yeah, I could live with that. Another question that has been profoundly helpful for me personally is as you stand in the face of a challenge, a risk, you're going to put yourself out there in some way. You say to yourself, what is the minimum benefit that I could get from this thing? Like, what's the least good thing that could come out of this experience? And I feel extremely strongly about what I'm about to say. If you want yourself or if you want your daughter to resist perfectionism, we have to help them appreciate the beauty of the process. We have to help them appreciate that there are always unanticipated benefits 
lessons, moments of inspiration and wisdom that come when we least expect it, that come when the big moment of glory doesn't arrive. So that even if you don't get into that play or you get a crappy chorus part and like, wow, that's a bummer and I'm sorry, there are other benefits that come from this experience. You make new friends. You learn a new skill. You learn that you can stick stuff out that's not what you thought it was going to be. I think that when we all imagine like what are, like if you think to yourself, what in the face of an obstacle have I learned? What from a heartbreak have I gained? We ask our, ourselves this question as adults. The, the same kind of wisdom will accrue to our children. We have to have faith that it will. I think as parents, you don't want them to be suffering, right? We don't want our children to be in anguish um, in any way. And yet the same wisdom and strength and courage that we have gained from our own obstacles will also come in due time to our children. And we have to have patience with that, create space for that. Because ultimately, if all we are driven by is the big polished finish, is the outcome, is the college essay worthy moment, then of course our children will be addicted to perfection. I wanna talk um, two more things I wanna say before I hand it over to Simone Marian from Girls Leadership. Um, Parents need to practice what psychologists call self-regulation just as much as our kids do, right? Just as much as we expect our kids to keep it together, we also as parents have to do that. Um, and that's because it's really hard to watch our teenagers go through the ups and downs, the chaos of this time. So here are three things you can do. One, remember she is still watching you. I say this because teenagers are exceptionally good at acting like they do not care at best what you say and think you're clueless and stupid at worst. Um, and it's very important to remember that even if you think your child doesn't want to connect with you anymore, it's not that. It's the way she wants to connect with you is deeply unsatisfying, often, often is the case. I'm just going to be assuming that everyone here is laughing on the inside about that one. Um, but anyway, I'm, I still think it's funny. So <laughs> thank you, Trudy, for laughing. Anyway, um, my point is that um, your kid, your teenager is absolutely still connected to you. They are still, they still want to know what you think. And the way that you react as a parent in the face of a problem, um, they are absolutely downloading that. They are mimicking it too, in the sense that just like they used to mimic the words you say when, when they were little, they're now starting to mimic how do you respond to distress? How do you respond when things don't go your way? They are watching us. Um, and we do have to be careful with how much anxiety we bring into our conversations with them. Number two, share your mistakes. Do not imagine that being a good role model to your kid is about acting like you never do anything wrong. When you do that, when you don't tell them about your setbacks, they think that it's not okay for them to experience them themselves and worse, or maybe related, they become afraid to tell you about their own mistakes. Number three, ask yourself this question, and this is a, a shout out to Cheryl Sandberg's question and lean in when she posed the question, what would you do if you weren't afraid? When you stand in the face of deep anxiety around your child, when you look at something that's not going well and you say, this thing happened, what if this means blank? Because I think parents can also catastrophize, right? We can also say something went wrong here. What if this means globally that she's not going to make friends? What if this means she's not that smart? What if this means she doesn't go to a good college? As parents, we have to check ourselves. We got to walk that back down away from the global anxiety down to what's really happening. And one of the best ways to do that is to ask yourself, all right, if I knew that everything was going to be okay, right? If I knew that whatever is freaking me out right now about my kid was going to be fine, if I could practice faith and optimism, if I were not afraid, how would you parent if you were not afraid? The choices that we make in that moment when we're not afraid, are so much wiser. They are choices we're much more likely to be proud of than when we make choices from a place of fear and what if, and what does this mean, and anxiety. The last thing I want to introduce you to is self-compassion. Self-compassion is a second um, strongly research-based palliative factor for adolescents. It is the practice of being gentle with yourself in the face of a challenge. Now, many people think that gentleness with yourself in the face of a challenge is not only a way of being lazy about your problems, but also could result in complete paralysis because who would possibly be motivated if they weren't being mean to themselves? This is, these are all common responses to self-compassion. Responses, I should say, like I had myself, for sure, when I first encountered it. In fact, 
what self-compassion is about is not pretending that something didn't happen or taking responsibility. It's basically about saying, yeah, something happened. I don't feel good about it, but I'm not going to trade away my self-worth in the process of dealing with it. Include. I also want to add that that research shows that self-compassion does not diminish motivation and it doesn't diminish performance standards. So here's what it is. Here's what. It, here's how it works. There are three steps that were developed by um, University of Texas at Austin professor Kristen Neff, who has a book of the same name, Self-Compassion, a wonderful website, of course, a TED Talk. And um, the three steps work this way, and I'm going to teach them by telling the Google world about something that happened to me and um, how I learned to practice self-compassion. So um, the first step is mindfulness. Now, several years ago, I was uh, really royally and radically dumped, and I went into a total tailspin about what this meant about me. So I um, am also an excellent catastrophizer, recovering now. And so I went into this place of, obviously, like I'm a broken human being who's going to die alone with dogs, not cats, because I'm allergic to cats, but I think you get my reference. And like, clearly nothing good will ever happen to me again in my life. So that's not mindful, right? Mindful is not catastrophizing. Mindfulness means, all right, something bad happened. What do I really feel right now? Like, what, what is my actual emotion? Not the denial or the catastrophe. I feel sad, right? Like, I'm grieving. And the next, well, this week, I mean, probably the next year is going to be really hard for me. The second step of self-compassion is self-kindness. This is hard for a lot of people, deceptively simple. And this basically means like if you had a really close friend who you loved who was being mean to themselves in the way that you were being mean to you, what would you say to your friend? Because the reality is, aren't we so much nicer to other people? We show other people so much more grace than we show ourselves. So this is a, a thing. I also do this, by the way, by channeling one of my best friends who I call my unicorn friend because she's like so much nicer sometimes I think than I am. I'm like, why are you friends with me? Because you're so nice. And like, do you ever have a friend like that? I call her my unicorn friend. Trudy actually knows her. And, um, and I imagine what my friend Daniela would say to me because she's so nice. And I think, what would Daniela say? I got to say that to myself. And then the, um, the third step of self-compassion, another really powerful step, is common humanity. And what that means is, are there other people who might be suffering the way I'm suffering? Like, am I the only one who's ever been dumped? Thank you, Google, for telling me that heartbreak advice gets 1.5 million hits. Google was instrumental in helping me understand that I was not alone. So thank you, Google. Seriously, I promise you, I did this. And when you know you're not alone, it is so helpful. The, the feeling of aloneness and isolation that so many of us have exacerbates shame. It makes us not want to solve a problem. And so reminding ourselves we do have a shared experience of suffering, we are not by ourselves, is absolutely powerful. So following these three steps, I strongly encourage you to practice this. You can do it in the middle of the night. If you ever wake up, you had an extra glass of red wine, you woke up at two in the morning. I'm not saying I've experienced that personally. Of course I have. And um, yeah, and you walk yourself through these three steps. You walk yourself and you practice, just like you practice risk-taking, just like you practice gratitude. The bottom line is that we all have to be able to access why we are enough as we are. And one of the best ways to do that is to ask yourself, what about me is valuable and of worth beyond my external standards of success, beyond my salary, beyond my position, beyond the accomplishments that I may want to share or that I think define me? What beyond those standards makes me enough as I am? And when you know that, you can be stronger than you ever thought possible. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I'd like to turn over the mic to Simone Marian, my dear friend, my colleague, um, who is fiercely committed to making sure that every girl, no matter what her income level or background, has the power and the skills to exercise the power of her voice. So I want to introduce everyone to Simone, the CEO and co-founder of Girls Leadership. Thank you, Rachel. Our mission at Girls Leadership is to equip girls with the skills to exercise the power of their voice. And we see this as the foundational skill of leadership, no matter what a girl wants to pursue, whether it is coding or business or arts or government and all the places where we want our girls to have leadership. 
And I would like to say, um, before telling you briefly about who we are, that I am so grateful to be back at Google and grateful for the support of, uh, of Googler's contributions and uh, the matching program here, which has made such a powerful difference um, in our work every year at Girls Leadership, particularly in our ability to serve girls in schools and low-income communities. So thank you for that support. Um, what makes Girls Leadership unique in the girl serving space is really three things. One is that we are the only organization uh, to partner with the adults in girls' lives. What we have found is that when we teach a girl the skills to exercise the power of her voice, but she goes back to a school or to a family that doesn't support that and doesn't understand her voice, that what we teach can be undone. But if we work with the girl, not only the girl, but also her parent, her teacher, the caregiver, the auntie, the nana in her life who's giving her scripts every day and giving her permission, that's true sustainable change. Um, so of the 10,000 people that we teach in person every year, over 5,000 of those are the adults and girls' lives. Um, the second thing that makes us unique is that we are really grounded in emotional intelligence, which I think is so much of the work that Rachel has been talking about, the social emotional learning, these invisible skills and processing um, that is as is the vital foundation of the external skills that we want them to demonstrate uh, in academics or in the workplace. And so our belief is that if a girl knows what she thinks and feels and needs, if she respects it, that's the hard part that many of us lose over the course of adolescence, and she has the ability to express it effectively, those three things will provide that foundation for her. The last piece that really makes us powerful is that we see girls' everyday relationships as her incubator for leadership. So rather than saying to the girls, if you are chosen as captain of the team, if you are president of the class, then you are a leader and you have influence, we are instead saying to girls, uh, leadership is a way of life. You get to decide in the countless decisions that you make every day uh, whether you're gonna have influence. When you decide whether you, how you look somebody in the eye, do you raise your hand in class when you don't know the answer? Do you raise your hand in class when you do know the answer? Where do you sit at lunch? A uh, high schooler recently reminded me, do you eat lunch? Uh, was a leadership uh, question that she had to face every day. Where do you sit at lunch? All of these countless decisions are opportunities that girls have to build the self-awareness and agency and ability to make change. Um, so those three things, emotional intelligence is the foundation, adults are our partners, and everyday relationships are the incubator or what makes girls leadership who we are. Uh, and right now we're focused on two strategic initiatives. Um, one is that we are looking deeply at the experience of girls and women of color and really trying to understand how does race, ethnicity, and income level impact gender expectations because what we're finding is there's very different uh, experiences that girls have in different cultures and if we can gather the data on that difference then we'll be able to reach the 25 million girls in the U.S. where they are across those uh, infinite differences that exist. So that's the first thing that we're doing and then we're also very much focused on uh, educator training as the vehicle to scaling our curriculum that uh, reaching each girl one by one is a slow process, but if we can reach the educators, the administrators, the principals, the people that have power over hundreds if not thousands of girls' lives, that's um, how we can really move the dial quickly in the U.S. And so the last thing I would like to say is um, we have a couple Googlers on our board, but if anyone would like to be involved and participate in this work, we are... Um, very grateful for the partnership and the support of many like Trudy McKenna has been here over the years for myself. Um, so please reach out to me if you're interested in being involved. Thank you. Great, thank you. Okay, let's go to Q&A. If you have a question in the room, go ahead and head to the mic um, and we will be watching the Dory for anybody who has questions. Again, it's go slash Rachel Simmons dash Dory. And oh, great, we have a question in the room. Let's start with that. Thank you. Uh, firstly, thank you very much, Rachel and Simone. Uh, my question might be, no, no, um, either of you can answer probably. Uh, my question is about, so uh, I observe this tendency among, so I have an eight-year-old girl myself, and I observe this tendency for her to like quickly identify her BFF at school and sort of uh, constrain her relationship with this 
just a small number of friends. So even if she is sitting next to a, another eight-year-old girl that she just met today, if she was a boy, then I think they there's more tendency for them to kind of play along well as, as long as this kid is well behaving. But um, my girl wouldn't talk. So I, I'm not sure if this is good or bad. Like caring more about relationship is good, but um, not expanding it is bad. So I'm not sure how this will pan out in her uh, future. So I, I wanted to get your thoughts. I think this is a Simone question. The BFF thing? Yes. I, would you want to come up here and um, we'll do a little duet on that? <laughs> Songs I don't have to sing. We sing Islands in the Stream? Uh, no? Yeah. I mean, there's incredible pressure on girls to find that BFF and not and to find her on the first day of kindergarten. And it's eye contact and there's rainbows and glitter, right? We, My little ponies. Yes. Jump around. Um, and and I think we do need, and, and the cost of that is like the BFF rules are basically you like all the same things, you do everything together and you never fight, right? Any of us as adults, if we can imagine a 24 hour relationship where we like all the same things, we do everything together and we never fight, right? This myth is the biggest setup of all time because of course all those things are gonna happen. So I think it is important that we dismantle that myth for girls and we really teach them what healthy relationships look like and that how to navigate disagreements and how to make people feel included. And it, it is, I have my, I have a six year old son and it's still every day, Teach, you know, giving him scripts and and teaching him about the impact of his relationship choices. And so when he doesn't talk to that person next to him, right, how does that make them feel? And what is, you know, and I call it leadership behavior. Like when you're, when you have influence and when you reach out to somebody and when you're inclusive, what's that change that you're making in the world and that they can take on that bigger label and that bigger meaning of their actions. So it is important to look at that myth and that gender expectation, dismantle it, and help her build the full set of skills to connect with people across a range of differences. Couldn't have said it better myself, so I hope that was helpful. Thank you. And we do have several questions on the Dory, so. All right, so our top question right now on the Dory is from Hillary, and she asks, how can parents lay the groundwork for these skills in younger children? I'm so happy you asked that, Hillary, because uh, I'm also the parent of a younger child. And you may know the common phrase, little kids, little problems, big kids, big problems. And so uh, by that, I take from that that little kids are somewhat more impressionable and easier, a little bit easier to work with. So what are some things you can do with a, a young child? Um, one, you can make the practice of gratitude part of every breakfast. So every day at breakfast, what is one thing you're grateful for? And you say it and they say it. Um, again, one of the benefits of doing this with younger children is that as they proceed into the eye rolling years, they at least have this laid, this groundwork that's been laid, um, which helps keep them much more connected. You have a much better chance of hanging on. Um, another thing you can do is um, talk with them about the way they talk to themselves. So if you if you're physically comfortable going to a place where you could maybe jump over something with your child. Like for example, like bouldering, climbing on rocks or walking by a creek and stepping on the rocks in the creek. And you sense your daughter anxious about something. And I'm using the creek as an example, but there are all kinds of things we might do with our child where she feels afraid when she's young. You say to her, it's a good thing to talk to yourself in a positive way to say, I can do this. I can do this. Teach her what internal self-talk sounds like. This is certainly something my daughter has, has absolutely internalized and who is almost six years old and who does this frequently. Um, another great thing to do is when your daughter is working on something that's challenging for her and you can feel her starting to either get frustrated or want to walk away from it, you go up and you give her tons of praise and you say, look how far you've gotten at this. Look how much you've done already. And that's known as process praise. Process praise is about making sure kids feel really good about being in the middle of a challenging process, making sure they feel praised for sticking with it and being a part of it, as opposed to waiting until they finished and cross the finish line, as it were, to give them the praise. We know from research that, and I find this amazing that they've been able to figure this out, coming out of Stanford, that um, even in toddlerhood, boys get more process praise than girls, in, in, which is unbelievable to me. And if you hear process praise, if you, if you are praised for, like another way to ask this is, um, let's say your kid is working on something and you say, tell me about the strategy that you used. And by the way, teach them the word strategy. 
because strategy implies there's always more than one solution. There's lots of different ways to do something. So what kind of strategy did you use to, to figure that out? And they can get excited about what they've done so far. So all of this helps make kids braver because it means they don't have to perform at the highest level. It means they know you care when they're in it and in the process and trying. So those are all things um, that you can do. There's, there's so much to do with younger girls. So first I want to say I'm currently reading enough as she is and one of the struggles I'm having is reading it as both being in as adult, like still being growing up and kind of trying to view it from maybe how my mother felt about me growing up um, and something that my mother and I've been talking about and trying to work out for a long time is the fact that it doesn't so much it didn't so much matter to me what she said it mattered to me what she did. And I would just mirror her behaviors, even if she was telling me the opposite. And as somebody who struggles with things in my own life, I wonder if you have any advice on if you know you have a problem and, a, and you participate in a behavior that would be very damaging to mimic, and yet you're still struggling yourself to not do it, how do you communicate this with, a, with somebody who might be watching you as a role model? Um, that's a great question. So meaning you have awareness of the behavior that someone is mimicking. Well, of course, the pat answer is do as I say, but not as I do. Um, but I think you're pointing to something deeper, which is, um, and something that's been studied actually, it's just beginning to be studied, which is the way that young people can tell the difference between what their parents' values are and what their parents actually say. So in other words, teens have a great BS detector. They know that their, their parent might say, oh, I really want you to be happy. And they at the same time know their parent is very committed to them getting to into the best possible college, which may actually contraindicate their happiness. And so, um, so I think that you're, you're really highlighting something that's quite, quite new in the, in the research. But of course, your question is about how do you relate to somebody when you know that you're, that you're modeling something um, that's not healthy. And I guess I think the kind of, um, I know Brene Brown was here at Google yesterday, I think vulnerability, authentic vulnerability is really important. So to be able to say, almost as part admission of what's going on, but also part apology, if you believe it's called for. I know on a smaller scale that in the moments where I let my own child down, when I fail my own child, whether it's because I have yelled in a way that wasn't appropriate or called for, or I have been too dismissive or distracted, I catch myself and I say, I'm really sorry for what I just did. And she'll say, it's okay, it's okay. Like, I think she gets like, mom, please stop being awkward because we live in New England. And um, <laughs> she apparently has no feelings. This is, uh, we've, anyway. Um, she's like, please stop, please stop. And she's only six, but I say, I try to say to her, you know, this, this wasn't right and I need to make right. I need to make it right. I need to make it better. I don't beat myself up, but I, so it's a combination of that vulnerability, that authentic vulnerability, um, but also being willing to be accountable and to say, I don't have it all together. And it goes back to what I said earlier about the importance of making mistakes in front of your kids. Because your kids need to know how to screw up as much as they need to know how to succeed. You will not have, you can't know how to succeed well, truly well, if you don't have the tools to make mistakes. And yet so many of us as parents, we err too much on the side of we're gonna teach you how to succeed. And that's really part of what this book is about. Um, I'm a big fan of the book Lean In. And I believe what we need to teach our kids to do is to lean inside so that they have the tools to be strong and to navigate the barriers and the unforeseen moments that arise when they are pursuing success. Great, we have another question on the Dory. This one's from Elizabeth. She says she's currently reading The Curse of the Good Girl, um, published in 2010, specifically in regard to part two, Breaking the Curse. Is there anything you'd update or advice you'd modify based on things you've learned and observed since it was published? Wow, that's a really good question. Um, well, I guess, yes, absolutely. And I actually talk about this in Enough As She Is. That's a wonderful question. Yeah, I kind of realized that I screwed up a little bit in The Curse of the Good Girl. So Elizabeth, um, mea culpa. And if you decide that you like my work enough to read the next one, um, you'll see I actually talk about this. So in The Curse of the Good Girl, I argue that the most important thing girls need in order to thrive is to break that curse, is to not have to sit like a girl all the time, is to be able to speak up and you know, not feel like they have to be modest and have conflicts and express their feelings. And I thought that if girls could do that, they would lead happier, um, healthier lives. But 
where, where I've, so here's the problem with that is that I was putting way too much emphasis on the role of the girl. I was not at all thinking about how toxic the culture is for the girl. And I think that just stems from my own like can do. I come from a very immigrant family. Like you can do it, like just bootstrap it, figure it out kind of mentality that I grew up with that actually wasn't fair to girls. The thing that I've realized now almost 10 years later is that the data that we see um, around the world really in terms of what girls are facing in, around anxiety and depression and stress and the percentage of girls who say on college campuses at the age of 18 that I feel overwhelmed by all I have to do. These are all stratospherically rising. That's not about the girl's failure. That's about the way we are failing girls. And so, um, and I do think becoming a parent changed things for me. Um, it, it, it allowed me to see the things that I could control and the things that I can't and that we all need to work together to change. All right, another question from the Dory from Shrilika. I apologize if I butchered your name. Um, she asks, teaching kids to be independent versus being there through the process. Example, would you sit with them passively or, act passively or actively through a homework or leave them to work it out if, if, and, and let them ask if they have a question? Such a great question. And I think as our kids get older, that is the kind of million dollar question is at, where is the balance between finding that zone of struggle and growth that doesn't push them over the edge and, and make them deteriorate into a tantrum or whatever. Um, I think that is an art. It's not a science. Um, I think that what we want to, let me tell you what we want to avoid. We want to avoid parenting and teaching girls who feel like they have to ask every five minutes, is this right? Is this right? Did I get it right? I don't know if this is right. What, and they, what happens is they go to their teachers and every couple minutes, they keep asking, is this exactly what you want? Teachers are now complaining about this to me all over the country. And um, it's called learned helplessness, basically. That, that So it, it is support seeking, right? It looks like support seeking, but it really what it is, is a fear that if I don't get it exactly right, oh my God, like it's going to be a crisis. Now that is not a muscle we want our kids to, to, to cultivate. And if you hear your teacher, your daughter's teacher talk about this, it's really important. So how do you find that balance? Well, first of all, I think you have to prepare your daughter beforehand and you say, listen, I know that you're going to be doing your homework and I want you to know that I'm here. And I also want you to know that my goal is for you to challenge yourself. And so I might not be as available to you as I usually am because I'm going to ask you to grapple with some stuff. Grapple might be a big word for your kid, but I'm going to ask you to work on stuff yourself. And I'm going to ask you to come up with some strategies yourself for how you could help yourself without necessarily using me. So I would say to a kid, what's one thing you could do other than asking me? Maybe it's to call a friend. Those are all powerful things that they can come up with to advocate for themselves, to make good on a problem that they have that don't involve going to you. Then I think you have to figure out, you have to find that growth edge, right? I think that's the phrase. You have to find that place with her where she's pushing herself, but not becoming so turned off by what she's doing that she doesn't want to do it. Because here's the thing. I, I think when kids really start to hate what they're doing, I mean, they hate what they're doing. So we also have to make sure that they're not getting um, kind of undone. And like I said, it is an art. I wish I had a, a good hard and fast rule for that. Actually, wait, I have one more thing to say. Sorry. I did think of it. It's hard to think on your feet because I'm like, what would I really say? So here's what I think. I would actually say to the kid, what is one way that you could challenge yourself that you've never challenged yourself before in doing your homework? That's what I would say. Let you, let's come up with something that you, that you would do to push yourself that you haven't done before. Okay. All right. And we've got one more question on the Dory. And I think it's the last question we'll have time for. And it's again from Hillary. And she asks, what is your take on single gender education for girls? Are there specific situations, personalities where parents should consider it? Yes, I think so. Um, my take on single gender education for girls is that it can be a, a, a very important um, and empowering and enriching experience for certain girls, um, but not necessarily for all girls. There's a lot of um, great research out there about, for example, um, I'm thinking of the work of Linda Sachs at UCLA, who has looked at the difference in confidence, self-reported confidence levels um, in the first year of college of uh, girls who have attended co-ed schools versus single gender schools. And there is a significant difference. The, the girls who come from the all-girls school say, uh, report higher levels of confidence, more speaking up in class. That being said, I mean, I think there are wonderful benefits to being part of a co-ed uh, community. I also think, are there certain kinds of girls that I would recommend a single sex school to? Yeah. I mean, 
I think about this a lot for my own soon to be six year old. And I think that if she turns out to be a kid who is very vulnerable to social pressure, particularly around boys, um, who has a hard time distinguishing between what she, what her own values are and what the values of her peers are, I might seriously consider putting her in an all girls school because I do think that particularly around middle school, because I think that during that period, the powerful, intense expectations to conform to what other people are doing um, can be very destructive for certain kinds of kids who are vulnerable. So I'm thinking a lot about that for my own daughter and watching her. Um, I also think that for those girls who need more attention around things like leadership development, speaking up, girls' schools tend to be more oriented to focusing on what the vulnerabilities are that girls bring. So I would say those two points of vulnerability to me would be reason to seriously consider an all-girls environment. Terrific. Well, with that, we are out of time. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank Join you. Thanking Rachel and Simone, please. Thank you. Thank you.